Yeah, we're going to talk about top 10 gadgets uh, for efficient total hip arthroplasty. Uh, most of these will be utilized through an anterior approach. These are my disclosures, some of which are pertinent here. So as far as top 10 gadgets in the OR, uh, notably I told Jeff I'm not much of a gadget guy, but uh, I'm willing to talk about kind of the tips and moves for efficient total hips. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about certain technologies that I do use. Uh, I don't have any conflicts uh, with any of these, which I think is important when you're talking about them and probably will use some kind of industry names just because that's what they go by. Um, efficiency in the operating room, uh, I think it's important, you know, to be an efficient surgeon, you don't want to repeat steps. You want to complete each step as you do them and not have any wasted motions. You know, there's lots of people in the operating room that may give the appearance that they're moving quickly but not actually getting a lot done. It's important to complete the step and then move on to the next step. Um, this is gonna lead to value, uh, both for you as a surgeon, uh, patients, and then obviously whatever facility that you're operating with. Um, the more efficient surgeon you are, the more value you're bringing to the system. As we talked about yesterday, we, uh, you know, having consistent teams is very important in being efficient in the operating room. I think this is probably the number one factor for me from an efficiency standpoint is the teams that we have uh, in both rooms and how they work together. So these are some of the gadgets and kind of uh, moves that we're gonna talk about for efficient total hips. We'll go through each one, so you don't need to necessarily uh, stay on this slide very long. The number one uh, thing is uh, digital templating. Uh, I think this is an important exercise for anybody at any level of arthroplasty, certainly trainees, those of you that teach out there. Um, you know, it's important to do this yourself. It helps you kind of plan the case as you go in your head, uh, whether you do that the day before or a month before when you sign the person up for surgery. Um, in our shop, we basically match the standing AP pelvis when we're talking about total hip arthroplasty and try to recreate that in the operating room. And so that's what we use when we're doing templating. Many of you probably have a templating software uh, that aids in this. This is the exact one that we use. Allows you to look at different cup choices, stem choices, which may fit the bone a little better. As I talked about earlier, I usually use kind of the same implant on every total hip um, and don't vary that case to case, but it does allow you to kind of anticipate any challenges that might, might happen, you know, probably 10 to 15% of the time, it's not gonna be your standard total hip that you do every day. So it makes you think a little bit more about the operation, about what kind of challenges you may have. As I talked about earlier, I'd use a direct anterior approach. I think this is reproducible uh, when performed in a stepwise manner. Uh, it can be very efficient uh, for total hip arthroplasty. Um, in order to set yourself up for success uh, in total hip arthroplasty, I think just like many operations, it's all about exposure, both on the acetabular and femoral side. This is going to lead you to efficiency. Uh, you know, total hip arthroplasty is not a hard uh, surgery to perform. If you can see what you're doing, you have good exposure. It can be very difficult and lead to complications if you don't have good exposure. So first, once we've uh, gone through the interval, uh, then we go on to the capsulotomy. There's a few different ways to do this. I like to split this uh, capsular area, split the femoral neck, and then go down the intertrochanteric line. Oftentimes, you can feel kind of this little vastus tubercle, little bump uh, underneath the capsule, and I kind of teach our fellows kind of shoot for that as the distal aspect of your capsulotomy. And so the second thing on the list is I do do anterior approach on the table, which I think can be very effective uh, and aid you in um, the operation. Um, you know, this is kind of talking about using external rotation in order to release that capsule on the front end, and it's going to help you later on the femoral exposure, as that's always kind of been the, stu the tough sticking point for anterior approach is getting femoral exposure. The acetabulum is usually much easier, but getting femoral exposure, there's certainly a learning curve there, but what I've found is you, know, you want to be aggressive with this release uh, early on uh, during the case of the capsule and then it allows the femur to come up later uh, when you're using femoral exposure. So you want to stay on the bone. I like to be able to put my finger on the lesser trochanter. That kind of gives me a point in my mind that I know that we've gotten far enough, we've released enough. And like I said, I'm fairly aggressive here. Um, those of you that do anterior approach, I think there's probably never a time that you get to the femoral exposure side and say, oh gosh, you know, I can see too much of the femur. I, I've exposed it too much. It's always having to continuously release more to get that femoral exposure. It also allows you to estimate the neck cut. I usually do this based on where I feel on my, uh, on the lesser trochanter. Um, there are other people that bring in fluoro, use an osteotome, use a bovi. I think this can sometimes lead to wasted steps and can be uh, combated later. 
The femoral neck cut is very important in anterior approach. Um, you know, a lot of people probably don't think about it a lot when you're doing a total hip arthroplasty. You just cut off the head and then move on. Um, I always kind of preach this to our fellows that, you know, the femoral neck cut can kind of make or break you in anterior approach. If you make this too high, it can be a disaster as far as getting uh, the brooch down the femur. It gets in the way acetabular reaming. Um, so I kind of just estimate this from the shoulder. I don't do a step cut because I think it's dangerous and puts the trochanter at risk. You can always kind of brush this up as needed on the back end uh, with the uh, femoral broaching. Um, I always do a napkin ring. I'm into things that work 100% of the time. There are a decent amount of patients that you can get out the femoral head and neck area uh, without a napkin ring, but some of your larger patients, muscular patients, it does make it more difficult. So I cut a neck, napkin ring on everybody. It aids in getting the head out. Like I talked about the long neck cut, um, this can make head removal difficult, makes you struggle with acetabular remia, and allows you to basically struggle through the whole case. You're not gonna look very slick if you make a long neck cut all the time. You're gonna struggle through many parts of the case. Um, and your femoral anatomy can be distorted because when you look at the femoral exposure and anterior to the arthroplasty, no matter how you've made that neck cut, it's gonna kind of look like this. You're not really gonna know where you are in space. And so if you've made that neck cut at a high level, or at an awkward angle, it can lead to perforations uh, out the femur. So acetabular exposure and reaming, uh, obviously you wanna get good exposure. I wanna recreate my AP pelvis uh, and that tilt based on that standing AP x-ray that I got in, uh, in clinic. Um, I usually ream line to line, uh, and then pack my cup. Um, I medialize first. I try to estimate the cup size on the front end and only use one other reamer. So if I know I'm going to do a 54 cup, I'll do a 52 reamer, 54 reamer, and then cup. I actually was trained in residency to start at a very low level of reamer, but I think that gives you a higher chance of eccentrically reaming and not uh, getting that central most important of the acetabulum. So another thing I use, I use offset reamers and cup inserters. Um, I think this allows you to make a smaller incision, makes, allows you to get your acetabular component in an appropriate position and you're not fighting the soft tissues of the thigh. That's gonna lead to higher cup abduction angles. So I think using offset reamers and impactors uh, is a good tool to use during an anterior approach. Um, using this uh, placement technique with the acetabulum. I do use fluoro to do this. I do use a grid that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we wanna match the AP pelvis. And then, you know, I find that using fluoro is adequate for acetabular cup placement uh, in anterior total hips, as well as measuring uh, leg length and offset. I don't use any computer navigation or robotics with primary total hip arthroplasty. So as far as uh, cup impaction, I do use an automated cup impactor. Uh, I really don't use any mallets in the operating room. I insert the cup uh, with this automated device as well as the femur. Um, makes it more fun for the surgeon. I've got a bad shoulder. I've had a few shoulder surgeries. I'm trying to prevent any further injuries. So I do use the uh, automated impaction device for this step as well. Um, you can do this under fluoroscopy. Allows you to change the angle uh, both abduction angle as well as antiversion angle um, with the automated device. So as far as femoral exposure, um, like I said, you know, if this is done correctly and you get good exposure, broaching is easy. Um, I'm pretty adamant with my fellows. I don't want them to start broaching until they feel like that their femoral exposure is adequate because that's when it can lead to perforations or fractures. If they don't have adequate exposure and you start broaching, that's when those complications come. Um, I have them find the piriformis fossa. You can do, usually do this with a bovie. Um, find the trochanter. I usually have a retractor over the top of the trochanter. And I kind of tell them anything inside the trochanter is fair game for them to release. Um, obviously, they don't want to get too, post, too posterior. That's where your external rotators are. I will occasionally uh, release piriformis. I uh, try to keep the other external rotators in, intact. So like I talked about before, we release out of the fossa. Um, you know, I will externally rotate the leg a little bit more if necessary, uh, up to about 140, 150 degrees. Um, and then you're able to lift, utilize the table to help lift up the femur to aid in femoral exposure. So some additional tips uh, that I kind of employ if uh, basically I can't get adequate femoral exposure, some of these bigger males, tighter muscular males. Uh, sometimes I'll have the anesthesia Trendelenburg the bed. Another uh, good technique that I found over time is just kind of taking the leg back over and up, sort of resetting, and then taking the leg back down and over again. I think that propagates your releases and you'll find that the exposure you have on the femur will be better with just that one move. 
I use this a lot. Uh, I use the first starter brooch as a canal finder, um, and I actually shoot an x-ray. It takes you know about 20 seconds to do this, but I think it saved me femoral fractures and perforations over time. Um, it allows, you know, nine times out of 10, they'll be in an adequate position where you can start broaching, but every now and again, it's pointed a little bit too much varus or maybe a little posterior. It allows me to know that I need to drop my hand or maybe get into the belly a little more. Um, but it gives you kind of a first look at where you're starting out broaching and then it allows you to broach with confidence throughout the rest of the case that you know you're in the right line. I do use a high speed burr. I don't use a calcar planer. Anybody that's used a calcar planer has probably seen calcar planer fractures. Um, kind of the joke in our operating room, people always wonder about it, but we always tell them that Takes a little bit more time, but not as long as wiring back the femur when you break it with a cow car planer. Um, so I usually burr at that first brooch that I put in if I think it's in an adequate position, and then I burr up a little bit on the last brooch. Uh, it also allows you to have that on the field. You can burr osteophytes around the acetabulum, any types of prominent screw heads that may be available that don't allow your poly to seat. So as I mentioned, I do employ automated broaching uh, in my operating room. I think this is an extremely effective uh, way to broach the femur. Uh, it's less time consuming, it's less physically demanding, and provides a better broach envelope for your cementless femoral stem. So this is just kind of a video showing sort of that uh, cookie cutter or box osteotome. Um, and then one of the big advantages of this, I think, especially when you're working with trainees, residents, and fellows, it gives consistent mallet blows at every step. So you don't have sometimes when they're hitting it kind of easy, sometimes they're hitting it kind of hard. Um, this really has been a game changer for my practice, both from a physical standpoint of not having to broach the femur um, and having a sore shoulder, as well as just kind of getting up to a bigger size, I feel like, with my cementless stems. It allows you to get a little bigger, fill that femur a little bit more with the stem that I use. Um, this is kind of the brooch envelope that you see, a nice compacted area that allows for placement of your femoral stem. As I mentioned, you know, this is less physically demanding. I've got a bad shoulder, allows me to still be able to play tennis and golf, things I like to do, rather than having to ice my shoulder after a long day in the operating room. A couple studies uh, that are starting to come out looking at automated broaching uh, and the rate of periprosthetic fractures. Um, these, th this study, I was a little surprised at how high the fracture rates were, even with automated broaching and standard broaching. I doubt that many of you have 5% rates of periprosthetic fracture. Uh, there's a more recent article from the Anderson Clinic uh, showing less than 1% fracture rates uh, using automated broaching. Um, and so, you know, I think this is a good thing to employ in your practice. I think it is safer. I think it leads to less periprosthetic fractures. Gripper retractors is another technology uh, that some of us at Ortho Carolina use. I have used before. I don't routinely use because I'm almost never in a situation where I have to do a total hip completely by myself, and that's what I talk to our fellows about. However, when they first go into practice, they may not have assistance with them. It's uh, a big selling point for them in their hospital if they're able to basically do a total hip completely by themselves. It's assistant free. That assistant doesn't move, doesn't get tired. Uh, no offense, Jen. Sorry, my PAs in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it does allow you to do total hips uh, you know, by yourself. Um, as far as the last or the ninth one is the ortho grid. Um, allows for a good leg length and offset restoration. They have a couple different versions of this device on the market. We use the older version, which is basically just a clamp that goes on the bottom of your C-arm. That's just a cellophane film, uh, basically an x-ray uh, film that goes on there. Allows you to draw lines, or the lines are already drawn on there, to estimate your leg length and offset appropriately. Um, I think the combination of this and fluoro uh, alleviates the need for further computer assistance or navigation or any robotics, at least in my practice. Um, what I found is, you know, you can use the computerized device, which they have. It's much more expensive. Um, they are selling it with some AI capabilities in the future. It doesn't have that now, but I think that is intriguing um, if it's able to do that from a predictive modeling standpoint uh, down the road. Um, but I've found that using these kind of computerized devices with leg length and offset restoration, all of us want perfection. You're going to keep chasing perfection. You know, I, personally, I'm not sure if I really want to know if the person's leg length is one or two millimeters off or their offset is one or two millimeters off because you're going to continue to try to chase that. Could end up in complications. 
So this is a study out of Utah and Jeremy Gilliland looking at this uh, grid. Uh, they compared patients with and without the grid through an anterior approach and found that the surgical time was decreased in these patients and actually improved acetabular component positioning uh, and restoration of leg length and offset. As far as stability testing, for me, we talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, through an anterior approach, I basically external rotate the patient to 90. I drop them down into extension. I think the biggest thing is putting the parts in the appropriate position. I think you're able to do that through an anterior approach with fluoroscopy. I think if you're able to do that, uh, it's really going to cut down on your instability rate uh, in general. The last thing on the list uh, is kind of addressing wound management. Uh, as I talked about before, I do use kind of this incisional wound vac system. Uh, in high-risk patients, uh, especially through an anterior approach, those patients with large BMI, large panises, immunocompromised, anybody we deem high risk, uh, if we think about this, then we go ahead and do it. I think there's very little downside. There is some cost to this, um, but it's not exorbitant, and I think it's very effective in these high-risk patients. This is a study uh, looking at direct anterior total lip arthroplasty in high-risk patients, uh, showing a much lower uh, rate of surgical site infection, uh, both superficial and deep, um, utilizing these devices uh, in a study looking at Aquacel versus this uh, basically incisional wound vac. So now we're ready for efficient total hips. Um, you know, direct anterior approach can be safe, efficient, lead to high patient satisfaction, and excellent outcomes for your patients. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. We'll follow up with um, Dr. Crow talking about robotics and navigation and hips. I'd like to start by congratulating and thank you, Derek and Jeff, for a wonderful program. So we discussed robotics with knees yesterday. Uh, and what we'll do this morning is talk not so much about navigation, uh, but robotics and what it might be able to do for total hip arthroplasty. No conflicts of interests or disclosures. And when you think about robotics, there are two flavors of robots. And this is important if you're reading the literature. There's the fully active uh, system, RoboDoc, that's used for the femoral component. And then the newer semi-active robot arm assisted systems like Mako from Stryker. Uh, today, we'll focus just on the robotic arms, and in particular, the Mako system. So not having done robotics, not having done robotics for total hips, uh, the claims for these systems are spectacular. Uh, if you use the robot, you have higher accuracy and precision of implantation increased patient satisfaction, increased return to activities of daily living, reduced complications such as dislocation, reduced utilization of health services, reduced payer costs, cost effectiveness. So if that's all true, why aren't we doing it? So let's look at the evidence. Should, should this be how we're routinely doing our hips? And there are many ways of looking at evidence. You can look at level of evidence. I like the evidence pyramid. So at the bottom, you have essentially expert opinion. And as you climb up the pyramid, you get increasing quality of information. Uh, at the top are meta-analyses. Uh, note that at any level, you can have lower quality methodology and higher quality methodology. So randomized controlled trials aren't all the same, meta-analyses aren't all the same. And I would say the most important level, if you're looking at evidence, are RCTs. Unfortunately, there are no RCTs with robotic arm THAs. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, despite the lack of RTCs, there's no lack of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So let's take a look at these. And I think it's pretty telling, one conclusion from an article JBGS reviews a couple years ago. So the existing literature comparing robotic THA and manual THA is scarce and low quality, with findings limited by methodologic flaws in study design. All right, so it may not be great, but we still have to make a decision, right? So even if the evidence isn't perfect, you still need something to guide your clinical decision making. So let's look at some of the outcomes that might be important to us. 
Let's start off with acetabular component positioning. And this is a comparison of uh, acetabular components uh, using uh, the Mako, which are the uh, which which are shown in in blue, as well as manual hip arthroplasty, and that's shown in green. Uh, inclination is on the x-axis, versions on the y-axis, and you can see that there's increased precision with the Mako. So the blue squares are tighter, uh, tighter have a tighter distribution than the green ones, and more accurate. So you have more cups in the box that you're shooting for compared to the green. So definitely increased precision, increased accuracy. How about leg length difference? And this is a meta-analysis. So it's looking at the four studies on the left as well as a combined analysis with the diamond in black below. Uh, if you look at the forest plot at zero, it would indicate that there's no difference uh, for robotic versus manual THA. So uh, the leg length would be higher in robotic if you're to the right of the zero, the vertical line with the zero. The leg length difference would be higher in manual total hips if you, if you were to the left. Uh, and there's a scatter of results from studies, but if you look at the overall analysis with the black triangle, there's a slight difference in leg length inequality, slightly larger in manual THA. But if you look at it, it's half a millimeter. So I'd say that that's not statistically or clinically significant. Let's look at patient reported outcomes. And this is the post-operative uh, Harris hip score. Again, to the left, you see the studies uh, with their individual results on the right. Uh, if a result was at the zero, the vertical line, then there's no difference. And a couple of interesting things here. So for all of the studies, it looks like the patient reported outcomes are better for robotic total hip arthroplasty. But the, the differences are small. Uh, and if you looked at the combined difference, it's statistically different, different uh, statistically significantly different, but it doesn't meet the clinically important difference for the Harris hip score. So again, there's this signal indicating that patients might do better, but they don't do better by a great deal. Uh, if you look at review of complications, at least with the data we have, there are no differences in overall complications, infection, dislocation, or revision. Let's look at one of the primary studies that wasn't included in these meta-analyses, and I would say that this is probably amongst the better quality studies. Uh, it's a prospective cohort. The numbers aren't huge, 50 patients in each group. Uh, and what they found was that, not surprisingly, there's more accurate acetabular component positioning with robotics, but no clinically or statistically significant difference in these uh, outcome scores, including the forgotten joint score. How does uh, robotic total hips compare to fluoroscopy? Dr. Faring just touched on that with his talk. And if you look at a comparison of direct anterior hips done either with robotic assistance or fluoroscopy, the differences are minimal. So there was a 0.8, less than one degree difference in acetabular inclination error, and no significant difference in anaversion leg length, discrepancy, femoral offset, or global offset. So let's talk about costs. Uh, and again, there's literature out there saying that robotic total hips are cost effective. We'll touch on that in just a little bit. But let's weigh the pros and cons, the added costs versus the potential cost savings. So the robot is expensive, whether or not you lease it, whether or not you buy it, it's hundreds of thousands or probably close to a million dollars. Uh, there's annual maintenance service contracts. There's the preoperative CT depending on the system you use, and they're all the disposable use, disposables that you use for each case. Uh, is that balanced by the improved quality of life? Uh, do you have decreased lengths of stay? Is there decreased sniff utilization? Are there decreased 90-day episode of care costs? And so, that, again, there are studies saying that 
episode of care costs are less with robotics, but cost effectiveness studies, cost studies are very, very, very sensitive to the methods you use, the assumptions you put in, uh, what you consider a cost or what you don't consider a cost. So if you look at these studies, be very careful. Uh, realize that the patient reported outcomes and potentially potential quality of life improvements, they're probably not that big. And if you don't take into account costs of the robot, service contracts, or disposables, you may get uh, a, a, an outcome that favors robotics. But if you do take care of those capital costs, uh, it's unlikely that it's going to be cost effective. So in conclusion, the best available evidence indicates that robotics uh, increase accuracy and, and precision of the acetabular component. Unfortunately, at short uh, follow-up with small numbers of patients, we haven't seen meaningful improvements in functions, complications, or revision rates. Not to say that that won't be shown with longer follow-up, but with the data we have today, which is relatively short with small numbers, we don't see a big difference. Uh, use of fluoroscopy can lead to similar radiographic results. And uh, in the absence of other studies or evidence, I'd have to say that robotic total hips increase healthcare costs. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Al. <clears throat> now we're going to have Dr. Huddleston talk about the stable hip. Have we solved the dislocation problem? Nader and good morning. I too want to congratulate Derek and Jeff for a great meeting. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, so have we solved uh, hip instability? These are my disclosures. The only one that's relevant is that I, I did uh, help a commercial entity commercialize a product that helps uh, do a, a spinal pelvic analysis on hips that have dislocated. So I think the answer to the question, have we solved instability, is no, um, but we have greatly reduced it, and uh, I'll show you how. So there are several factors, I think, that have influenced why the dislocation rate has been going down on the whole. So um, I think we have a better definition of what our actual target is and uh, a greater appreciation uh, that not all patients should be uh, uh, treated the same, i.e. the implants shouldn't be in the same position and they shouldn't necessarily get the same articulation. Um, and in line with that, I think uh, we all agree that the traditional static Lewinic safe zone is too blunt of an instrument to use, and uh, we're now using the concept of functional alignment. Um, we have a better understanding of how spinal pelvic mechanics influences uh, socket position and subsequent premature impingement, and uh, this has led us to be able to recognize those folks who we think would be at high risk for instability. And I think with some simple additional preoperative imaging, we can uh, potentially modify implant placement a, a bit and uh, reduce the dislocation risk. And then there's no question uh, that we have improved implant positioning uh, based on navigation and robotics and uh, intraoperative x-rays. And we have improved stability as well due to large heads, dual mobility, and uh, an anterior approach. So let's see the data showing the dislocation risk going down. So this is uh, from 2004, uh, Masonis and Born, and you can see the dislocation rates there, posterior 3.4%. Uh, transtrochanteric 1.5 and anterior lateral 0 0.7, and they concluded that the major drivers of instability were surgical approach and implant position. So we'll use that as our historic benchmark. That's certainly lower than it was even earlier than that. But in general, the modern dislocation risk for all comers should be below 2% for primary total hip arthroplasty. 
And many people have shown that uh, using big heads, specifically 36 millimeters and greater, have uh, resulted in decreased dislocation rates due to greater impingement free range of motion. And this is a large series from the Dutch arthroplasty register um, with 166,000 patients. So there's more recent data from Art Malkany at Louisville, and uh, he's uh, shown in this Medicare population going from 1999 to just recently that the dislocation risk is going down uh, to about 1.5%. And uh, on the bottom right there, he shows that uh, as the dislocation risk goes down, there's a nice increase in the use of 36 millimeter or greater heads, uh, which is certainly one of the drivers of this. Um, so I think the anterior approach has definitely produced a lower dislocation risk than other approaches. Uh, but it's definitely not zero, and uh, I think this is what we should all be shooting for if you're using a posterior approach. Uh, so this is uh, 3,000 hips from hospital for special surgery, multiple surgeons, and this is the uh, most recent data for posterior approach showing a dislocation risk using some sort of technology, so whether that's navigation robotics or intraoperative x-ray, was dealer's choice, and that risk uh, was 0.35%. Um, so that's going to be hard to beat regardless of the approach or what you're using, but that would be considered the gold standard now. Um, so I don't think there's any argument that the rates of dislocation are going down, which is great. Uh, we are making a dent there. Um, so uh, what about trying to find the best position for every patient? Well, um, this is 2015, and these are Mayo Clinic data. Uh, there were some data from Mass General that won an award as well a little bit earlier, but showed the same thing, that uh, folks were starting to realize that they're having uh, patients dislocate who are out of the traditional 40-20 Lewinic safe zone. And so the question was why, uh, and we now have some answers to that. So this is a great paper from Eric um, in 2016 uh, showing that uh, the more levels that are fused in the lumbar spine in a Medicare population, the higher the dislocation risk is. So without a fusion in the Medicare population, almost a million patients, 2.4 uh, rate of dislocation with one to two levels, 4.3, and greater than two levels, 7.5%. So this suggests that the stiff spine is causing patients to try to move more through their hip joint, which causes more impingement, which will lead to dislocation. Uh, next year, we saw some data from John Vidorczyk showing with people who have a spinal sagittal deformity, so that's essentially your head is not centered over your pelvis in the sagittal plane. Uh, they had a much higher dislocation risk, 8%. And then that went on to spur a bunch of different papers that uh, basically showed that uh, spinal deformity, so your head not centered over your pelvis and lumbar stiffness were really drivers of uh, instability and the need for revision surgery. And Larry Doerr showed in this uh, group of late dislocators that a lot of this is uh, probably increasing stiffness as folks get older doing, uh, due to increased spondylosis rates. So that's led to uh, sort of the formal death of the Lewinic safe zone, and uh, people are now espousing this concept of uh, functional alignment. And these are editorials from BJJ, Ferris and Dodd, and also from Journal Arthroplasty, Larry Dorr and uh, John Callahan. So the concept is that the variation in pelvic tilt changes the static cup position, and uh, this change in position during routine activities may lead to impingement and subsequent dislocation. And then each individual has an optimal functional position that may differ from the so-called static position, and that really we should be shooting for this functional position. So you can look at uh, the sacral slope, uh, you can look at uh, pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis mismatch, or you can look at uh, the anterior pelvic plane. I um, learned about this uh, using the anterior pelvic plane, which was uh, uh, really the uh, uh, first um, classification that helped us understand it. And uh, I think using the sacral slope is fine. Uh, Ellie showed us uh, John Vidorczyk's classification, which I think is, is nice and simple and definitely uh, helps us, but this is a little bit easier for me to understand. And so the anterior pelvic plane you can see uh, on the bottom is basically a line uh, compared to the vertical and the lines between the ASIS and uh, the pubic tubercle. And the ASISs don't have to be lined up. They can be up to a centimeter apart, and there's not really much change in the calculation if you split the difference. So the rule of thumb should be that for every 10-degree uh, change in pelvic tilt, uh, that's going to result in approximately 7-degree change in the version of the socket. So this is what happens when you have excessive posterior tilts. This is the most common deformity with a stiff lumbar spine, so you get impingement and extension, and that can predispose one to have uh, anterior dislocation. And the opposite is true uh, when you have excessive anterior tilt. Uh, so we see these in, in the dreaded hypermobile pelvis. Fortunately, these are not very common and certainly not nearly as common as the stiff spine where you're usually going to get posterior tilt. But with anterior tilt, you get impingement and flexion and then a posterior dislocation. 
And this is Dr. Vodorczyk's classification. I won't uh, belabor it, but it, it's pretty easy. You just divide people into whether uh, their head is centered over their pelvis or not. And uh, then within each of those subcategories, you look at sort of what their stiffness level is defined as changes in sacral slope. And Ellie showed this. He has some recommendations for uh, where the socket could go. I think this is a little bit over uh, simplified, but at least it gets folks thinking about it. So uh, this has led us to now have a pretty good understanding of who would be considered high risk for uh, primary hip replacement. So anybody with either a stiff spine or a hypermobile spine, anyone who you can't put a large articulation in, certainly the non-compliant uh, alcohol uh, users and uh, cognitive impairment, and then folks with neurodegenerative disease, so Parkinson's, CP, and Down syndrome. Hyperflexible folks like the ballerinas and the uh, yoga teachers may get impingement prematurely, and then certainly anybody with abductor insufficiency, and then femoral neck fracture and conversion hip replacement patients. So these patients generally have a normal hip one day, and then uh, immediately they don't have a normal hip and have a hip replacement. So that's much different than having years and potentially decades long of a prodrome of a stiffening hip and subsequently withdrawing from certain activities. So this is just really a gestalt. They don't all have good evidence to say that they are high risk, but this is how I like to think about it. And uh, this is a paper from Guo Li in Philadelphia, and now uh, HSS, showing that uh, there are some data to support uh, some of these relative indications. And he advocated using a dual mobility in these folks, or at least to consider it. So folks with neuromuscular disease, um, if you uh, have a fracture, uh, and then if you have uh, either a stiff or hypermobile spine. And uh, don't forget that you don't have to have an instrument of fusion just to have a hip uh, uh, that is, or a spine that is stiff. Um, so this is uh, looking at Doug Dennis's um, patient population, and they said uh, at least 6% of the folks that they saw who were going to have a hip replacement and did not have an instrumented fusion uh, or a non-instrumented fusion, they had uh, what would meet the criteria for a stiff spine. So it's common. Um, so what are you going to do with this information? So uh, if you're really concerned about it, uh, there is um, a product where you can get a CT scan as well as the standing lateral radiographs of folks standing and then flexed uh, uh, seated. Um, Getting the CT scan is definitely a hassle, uh, but it can be done, and the CT scan has to be sent off to the company in Australia. So they give you a nice report showing what uh, your real target zone should be and where you're at risk. Um, so I, I've done a lot of this. I've gotten away from this, unless I'm very worried about the patient. and. You know, I think this helps the surgeon think about it, but there's also a component to helping uh, the patient think about it. So this is kind of how I like to think of how an abduction brace helps people reduce dislocation after uh, revision hip replacement. And uh, brace is certainly a hassle, but at least it reminds them that they're doing something to try to minimize putting their hip in a compromising position. So if you're making patients get a CT scan or additional x-rays, uh, that's something they have to pay for, and hopefully that has some influence on them behaving post-op. So these are very easy x-rays to get. You can do it in your office. It doesn't take much time. And uh, so it's a, a standing lateral x-ray. And you can look at the standing pelvic tilt. In this patient, it was 1.2 degrees posterior. And uh, then it's a flex seated position. And uh, I think it's important that the patient is able to flex here. So generally, people don't dislocate just sitting uh, with their hip at 90 degrees. So they, they dislocate when they uh, flex more than 90 degrees. And so I think it's important to see how far they actually tilt and put them in, in a flex position. So this person has 15 degrees of anterior tilt. And I would say, in this case, that's going to be functional retroversion of the socket. So you probably want to make sure you have enough antiversion in the system. So dual mobilities definitely reduce dislocation uh, rates, as uh, Al showed. So just to review uh, why uh, and give you some history about this. So this was designed as a monoblock by Bousquet in France in 1974. And it's postulated that it works by increasing the jump distance in appropriately positioned sockets. And uh, his original prosthesis was called the Nove and has good 25-year survivorship, 91% in a small series, 212 hips, but no dislocations. But he did have uh, 10 intraprosthetic dislocations. So that's like a 5% rate of intraprosthetic dislocation, which, uh, as you all already heard, that requires another trip to the operating room. So we are definitely in favor of bringing the patients to the operating room to uh, do the uh, reduction for people who have dual mobilities. That is, if we can get them past the emergency room where uh, our emergency room chairman thinks that it's a good idea to have the emergency room try to reduce all hips before they call us. That's a different story. So uh, most of the motion here is at the inner bearing, and then uh, you can get some additional 10 to 15 degrees if the uh, uh, outer bearing moves a little bit more. There are definitely some uh, uh, fluoroscopic studies to show there's not all that much motion between the two bearings. So. 
So this is uh, uh, how it works. So this is from my boss, Bill Maloney, but uh, this is a 45 degree inclinated socket, which would be considered uh, average. And so with a 22 millimeter head to get it out of the socket, you have to drop seven millimeters and you have to displace laterally 14 millimeters. If you go up to a 36 millimeter head, you can see how these two things increase. So the drop height's gonna go to 11 and uh, the lateral displacement's gonna go to 21 millimeters. So, but if the socket is not, um, in the appropriate position, and for this case, say that it was more inclined, um, you're going to uh, reduce both of those numbers. All right, so uh, dual mobility definitely reduces dislocation in multiple series. So this is a nice systematic review from Matt Abdel. And in primary hip replacement, uh, dislocation risk for dual mobility, the rate was 0.9%. Uh, compared to 6.8% at eight years, so that's pretty impressive uh, reduction. I will say that's a very high dislocation risk uh, for uh, uh, any population. So, and then for revisions, it's the same story. So 2.2 dislocation risk at four years, and then uh, if you didn't use a dual mobility, it was 7.1%. So that's showing a, a statistical and certainly clinically significant reduction with dual mobility. And what about in high-risk patients? So these are some recent data from American Joint Replacement Registry. It's 15,000 patients, and they looked at the outcomes of dual mobility in terms of stability in patients who had either a known lumbar spinal fusion or a lumbar degenerative disc disease. So at 90 days, uh, the fixed bearing dislocation rate was 1.2, and with the dual mobility, it was 0.68. So it was almost a 40% reduction. And then at one year, similar story. So fixed bearing dislocation risk, 1.7 compared to the dual mobility, which is 0 0.9, so almost a 50% uh, relative risk reduction. So impressive reductions even in high-risk patients, which is what we'd expect. So um, you see a lot of people using dual mobility, and the uh, registry data supports that. So uh, it's about 10 to 11% of all the primaries in the United States right now. And uh, if you look at the graph on the right, the red bars are the use of dual mobility, and then constrained liners are at the top. So uh, I'll talk in a minute about the difference between constrained and dual mobility and what the success rates are there. But the use of dual mobility is coming at the uh, cost of reduced constrained liners, which is probably a good thing. So these are 10-year follow-up data looking at patients older than 65, and you can see a higher uh, cumulative percent revision. That's the red line for folks who had a dual mobility compared to a, a, a fixed bearing. Uh, and if you look at Australia, um, you can see that if you use dual mobility, which is that blue line or a constrained liner, which is the green line, both of those had a, a significant reduction in instability in cases for instability. So these are revisions for instability showing constrained liners and dual mobility across the board reducing re-revision for instability. So Al touched on this a little bit, but um, and I think Derek did as well, but uh, if you can get a 36 or 40 millimeter fixed bearing head, you probably don't need to use a dual mobility. We don't have a lot of data on that, uh, but we do have uh, some. So these are four papers, uh, and they're not all supportive of that. But in general, I think most of us, if you're gonna able to get a 36 or a 40, uh, you probably don't need to use a dual mobility. So what about constrained versus dual mobility? So the pooled incidence of dislocation is, is uh, a quarter for dual mobility compared to constrained, so 1.1 to 0 0.25. Um, in terms of reducing revision rate, uh, not a huge uh, decrease, so 0.3% for constrained compared to 0.2% for dual mobility. And then if you look at loosening rates, it's a little bit less for dual mobility. Um, and some of that uh, depends on whether it's a fresh socket or not. But um, probably dual mobility is better for that as well, but I wouldn't say that's uh, uh, something that's proven by the data yet. Um, and then just to look at the intraprosthetic dislocation risk, so this is a systematic review. Um, this x-ray is a patient uh, that I took care of that uh, if Tom Barber is here, he may recognize that x-ray. That was a uh, dissociated uh, bearing that my uh, uh, fellow and I missed um, and uh, showed up squeaking a few weeks later. Um, and uh, this systematic review shows an intraprosthetic dislocation risk for primaries of about 1.1%, and uh, for revisions, it's a little bit lower, 0.3%. I'm not quite sure why, but both of these work well. So, so what are the concerns with dual mobility? So there is definitely corrosion happening there, um, and uh, fortunately, we haven't seen a whole lot of problems with this yet. We may. Um, we heard about this already earlier this morning from Ellie, but uh, the issue of malseeding is a real one, and uh, I think it's probably design specific. Some of these are a little bit easier to get properly seated than others, but the, the uh, rate of malseeding is somewhere between 1 and 5.8%. 
fortunately, uh, despite the malseeding and despite the known corrosion, it does not appear so far in any way that uh, there's a problem with adverse local tissue reactions based on the fact that the serum metal levels are generally uh, pretty low, but I would say stay tuned on that. And then wear doesn't seem to be an issue either. The linear wear rate is uh, 0.07 millimeters per year, which would be considered uh, below the so-called osteolysis threshold, if you believe in that, and same for the volumetric wear, and it's pretty similar to a fixed bearing, so it hasn't uh, proven to be an issue. So I would advocate for judicious use of dual mobility constructs in complex primaries and revisions uh, for patients who are at high risk for dislocation, and you could certainly make a risk that all revisions should have a dual mobility, as uh, Dr. Ward pointed out earlier. I certainly agree with that, but I don't think that they should be used in a knee-jerk reaction for everybody. So my take-home message is that we are seeing uh, reduction in dislocation, uh, which is great. Uh, there are some drivers of this, so use of large articulations, whether it's fixed bearing or dual mobility, and then use of an anterior approach certainly helps. Uh, technology helps us put a, uh, implants in uh, what we think is uh, a more uh, appropriate position for the patient, so improve precision and accuracy. Uh, and then a hip spine analysis, certainly in high-risk patients, we think uh, can help, and the data bears that out. So I can just tell you what I do, um, having gone through all these steps to learn this and uh, using CT scans for a long time, so I've gotten away from that. So I, I use a posterior approach. I uh, will figure out who a high-risk patient is. So if they've had a fusion, uh, if, they, if I can see that they have lumbar spondylosis on their AP pelvis, um, and then certainly if they have any back symptoms, um, those people right away are gonna be high risk regardless of whether they have any other risk factors. And the other risk factors you all know, so those are easy to pick out, but um, so so uh, I will get standing lateral and flex seated x-rays and anybody who I think is high risk and I'll try to uh, remember to talk to them about this beforehand. And then we'll just look at the delta between standing and flex seated. So if they're rotating anteriorly, we're going to try to put a little bit more antiversion in the system. And if they're rotating posteriorly, we're going to try to put a little bit uh, uh, less antiversion in the system. And it's really no more complicated than this. And, and I think if you can take anything away from this discussion, that's what I would try to remember. Uh, you don't have to remember all the angles. You don't don't have to look at the sacred slope. Uh, if you just look at, at, at this concept and try to remember that, I think you'll be in good shape. So I do take an intraoperative x-ray I have for uh, over 10 years, um, and I do think that helps. It's not always easy to get a perfect x-ray, and you can get misleading information, but I do think it helps. And then I have uh, migrated over the last uh, five or 10 years to using the biggest uh, head that I possibly can get in a fixed uh, uh, bearing, so I'll use a 40 head uh, routinely. Uh, and then as I said earlier, I'll use a dual mobility in patients who I think are higher risk, but I certainly use a socket that can accept the dual mobility if the patient becomes unstable and I have to go back and revise them. So thanks very much for your attention. And our last speaker for this session is going to be our course chair, uh, Jeff, is going to talk about hip advancements and implants to implantation. Sorry, give me a second here. All right, so um, <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to talk about some. Um, I put the advances in quotes because um, uh, <clears throat> you'll, you'll see in a second, but. Um, <laughs> These are my disclosures. Some of them are relevant, and so I don't get any royalties for anything, but I have done some work with some of the companies, and you'll see some pictures. I'm not going to try and say names throughout the entire thing, and anything I'm showing, I pick things that have at least two options available, so I'm not, I'm not pushing a single product. Um, but uh, Ellie kind of uh, beat me to the punch here on, on some of these topics, um, but we're going to kind of go forward to the past and um, kind of look into some quote unquote advances that have been around for a while, but now are kind of regaining traction. Um, and so, you know, there's this thought that if you can't remember the past, you're condemned to repeat it, but I would say sometimes maybe an idea was just too early for its time, and maybe it should be repeated. So there's a lot of examples of this. Um, Webvan was actually Instacart in the 90s, and kind of just the world wasn't really ready for other people picking their, their fruit for them, um, and it took a pandemic and kind of wiping things down with, with Clorox wipes for us to be okay with that. Um, Virtual Boy was the, the first like kind of Oculus and technology wasn't really ready 
for that. Um, and then Friendster was actually Facebook, but it came out four years before exactly the same, but people just didn't have fast enough internet to get their pictures up, and so the infrastructure wasn't ready for this yet. Um, and four years later, Facebook basically copied them, and now, now we all know where they're at. And then there's some things that are kind of combinations of tech and infrastructure. This was the GM EV1, um, which was an electric vehicle in the 90s uh, that also just never gained traction. And so there's a lot of advances in hip replacement that I think uh, we're kind of coming back to and um, starting to see some, some cool results. As a, and so these are the five things that I'm going to talk about. Um, the first is, uh, is kind of in this category of automated impactor, and Keith kind of covered this a little bit, but um, when we think of automation, auto we all, always kind of go to robotics as kind of the default, but there's other things that can be done to make our jobs easier or with less input or less uh, work on our end um, that, that kind of counts as this automation. And so automated impactors have been around for a long time, um, and you know this is something that's been out since the, the 90s with this, this woodpecker that I think a lot of us have had experiences with, um, and I don't know why this isn't working, but um, you know, this is a video that, that shows just how old it is because the video looks old. Um, I don't expect you to be able to read that. I don't know why it's not working, but um, anyway, it's a video from the 90s. Um, and so anyone who's been at UCSF has seen this thing because Dr. Kim still uses it, um, and uh, you know, this had its issues with it. Um, it never really got widespread acceptance because it required you to hook it up to a gas uh, hookup. Um, didn't really have enough power to it. Um, and this is a picture of uh, Debbie Dang and her husband. Um, Debbie was pregnant on service at the VA one time using this woodpecker and claims that it almost shook her baby out and was yelling at Dr. Dr. Kim as a result of it. So the baby shaker. Um, so this technology needed to kind of evolve a little bit before it was going to be implemented in the OR, had to be easier to use, had to make our life easier. And so this is just a video from, um, you know, Tuesday of me using this. And, you know, people that say it's too heavy and too unwieldy, like I didn't know he was videoing yet. And you can see you just palm it with one hand um, and kind of just get this thing going. Uh, it's just very simple. I hope to never have shoulder problems like a lot of the older surgeons here. Um, and this just makes your job easier. So, you know, this is uh, multiple companies now have this. There's two in the market right now, and there's more on the way. Um, it goes forward and backwards. You know, it's uh, an inline application of force, which I think is the biggest thing. And so anecdotal advantage to this thing, uh, Keith kind of talked about this, but it's faster. It's more reproducible. There's less force per impact. So I think you will start seeing data that there's less fractures. Um, it's improved rotational stability, which I think is probably the biggest advantage, is that broach envelope looks really nice at the end of every case. Um, less releases, that offset impactor kind of makes it easier for me not to have to do as many releases from a DA approach. Um, and for me, it's easier to teach. I can kind of know that they're not going to break the femur, they're not wiggling their hand, I can have my hand on it at the same time, um, and I know they're not going to hit it too hard or be glancing. They also think they're doing something because they're pulling a trigger, but really I'm pushing it where it needs to go. Um, um, so it's nice to, to teach with it. Um, and on average, I haven't looked at my stuff, but just anecdotally, you get about one size larger than you would with a manual brooch. <clears throat> um, there's other uh, applications for these things. You can use them for uh, sleeve broaching. Uh, I imagine you're going to start seeing this being used for basically anything that you would usually use a mallet for. Um, and again, in DA, you know, this is this is something that we don't talk about as much, but I think DA might have pushed this back into the, the forefront. It's kind of Instacart's work from home. Um, there is definitely a susceptibility to stem prep issues if you don't have good exposure. And so this might be kind of gaining more traction as we kind of see this makes it easier, less stem issues, less fractures, less maybe loosening. Um, and it also works really well with collared stems that are kind of coming back into vogue and uh, makes that envelope reproducible, makes you be able to seat the implant back where you want it to go um, and saves you hundreds of swings. <clears throat> so we definitely need data for this. Um, there's definitely room for improvement in a lot of these things in terms of their size, the reliability, um, noise. There are certain applications where you might want more force. Um, and you also have to be able to tolerate abuse from your partners. Uh, Dr. Vale used to call me tender arm because I didn't think I could swing a mallet or broach a femur. Um, but, you know, I, I'm okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> 
So uh, the next advancement I want to talk about is custom implants. Um, this has also been around for a really long time, and the idea of you know personalized medicine, making the perfect uh, stem for everybody or the perfect socket for everybody. Um, this is a, a, a X-ray of some from the 1980s, like a Tech Medica implant, which were these like you'd make a cast and then they'd make the implant in a truck in the parking lot and then they put it back in. Um, and so th this idea of custom implants kind of is still used a lot. Uh, this is prior prior generations of custom triflanges. Um, they took months to manufacture. You had limited things that you could change. Um, you know, I remember uh, Dr. Faring's uh, dad, we were doing triflanges and they would get a model. He'd like tweak one screw, send it back to the company. Three weeks later, it'd come back. He'd tweak another screw, go back to the company. It was like the slowest process ever. Um, and so now we've gotten to the point, though, that when these kind of patients roll into your clinic, you know, all these acetabular disasters. You don't want to be waiting six months every time. Um, and so there are quicker and easier solutions with 3D printing of these implants. You can make the implants however you want. Um, you can use CAD designs to change them on the fly. Uh, and this is, a, this is a video of like, you know, designing one of these implants. Uh, this does not work well. Eventually to get to the point that you can see the screws, you can just move them wherever you want. Um, the engineers for this are really good at kind of just moving stuff around exactly how you want it. Um, and you can get 3D printed, you know, acetabular designs and see what the cup looks like ahead of time. And it takes days, not, not months. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's now quicker turnover. Uh, the designs are, are fast. Um, the on-growth surfaces have really improved that you can kind of make these trabecular type designs however you want. There's locking screw options. Um, and then you can cement in things like a dual mobility liner. These are monoblock liners, not the modular ones. Um, so less, less issues, hopefully. And so, and so can get some, some big reconstructions. So uh, hide your kids. These are some uh, ortho porn <laughs> coming up here. But some cases of these kind of custom implants. This is a uh, a patient from down the peninsula a little bit um, who came to us after uh, an infection and kind of a failure of, a, of an RIF. So spacer, uh, you know, this is a huge hole, uh, came back in with a custom implant, and this is his x-rays at uh, two years. He actually uh, moved to Florida six weeks post-op, and I sent him to Chance Gray. So maybe Chance is taking care of him right now. That's why he's not here. Um, this is another case of a triflange. This one I call the pickup sticks case. This was uh, one of the tumor surgeons did this for a revision arthroplasty 20 years prior. Patient kind of disappeared. Um, all these patients have kind of a, a certain look to them, and, and this was definitely one of those patients. Um, and so that's a. That, this was actually the first triflange I did in practice, which was a fun one to, to do. Um, this was one that saw a local surgeon and said, hey, this looks great. This was done five years ago. You're doing well. Yeah, don't, don't mind that noise and stuff. You know, you're, you're doing fine. And they came for a second opinion, and we fixed it with, a, with another triflange. And you can tell when a triflange is working well when you get these screws in the, in the pubis going way in there. You know it's sitting where you wanted it to be. Um, and these 3D printed ones work really well. You can do it for tumor cases as well. These are some big, big wax in the pelvis. Um, but yes, it's beautiful. Um, so the, the next advancement I want to talk about was collared stems. Um, you heard a little bit about this in the, the first part, but some people love good collars. <laughs> uh, can't button their shirts, but they like, <laughs> like collars. Um, so these have always been around. The first implants had collars on them. A lot of early cementless uh, stems had collars on them, uh, a lot in the 80s and 90s. Um, these were beasts of stems. You know, these are huge, uh, huge fully coated stems. Most people, when you ask them why would you use a collar, they're going to say for axial stability or decreased stress shielding. Um, which I would argue is probably not the main reason. Um, in the 2000s, there was kind of a move away from them because we got better on-growth surfaces. They still weren't doing a great job at stress shielding or, or protecting against subsidence. Um, there's inconsistent seeding of a lot of these type of implants. They would pot. They're really stiff. Um, and so, you know, there was a, also a breakout of a different type of stem that worked really well, and that was the wedge tapers um, and, and some of these more kind of HA-coded type stems, uh, compaction brooch stems. They were simpler. Um, they would allow, quote unquote, controlled subsidence early on. You would never have any x-rays of floating collars. Um, and with, with metaphyseal fixation of better surfaces, you weren't getting as much stress shielding. 
But I think through this, we kind of lost what the collar was actually best at, and that's rotational stability. So when you're looking at a collar, uh, rotational stability is, is the biggest thing. And if you're gonna take away nothing from this talk, just take away this slide right here, that a collar is gonna protect you from rotational instability and subsequently early fractures. Um, and the reason it does that is if you look at this this thing that I did right here is there's two planes of rotation when you have a collar. One is what the stem wants to do down the diaphysis, which is rotate in that plane. And the collar, in order for that to rotate in that plane, is gonna have to push through all the bone and either break through cortical bone here or, or really move that envelope in a very wide uh, dimension to get any sort of instability. And so that, that's a, what I would argue is the collar's advantage. And this is, we saw some of the data already early this morning, but collar is protective against fracture. In every series, it is protective against fracture. There's some that have the same implant, which is exactly the same with and without a collar, and the collared version always outperforms the collarless version. This extends even, there's been some recent stuff looking at even the collared versus collarless cemented stems with the, col with the collared versions outperforming the collarless um, in terms of fracture and survivorship. Um, so collars are back. Um, I, there's, this is the fastest growing utilization of stems are these collared uh, types of implants. Um, I blacked out all these on purpose because I don't want you to know what they are, but there is one stem that now has been out for a decent amount of time. Uh, the revision, this is AJRR data, which has its inherent limitations, but it, it does point out what, what I'm trying to say here and that this collar, this is the only uh, stem that's collared as the only option. Um, and so the only all collared stem is outperforming all the others by a factor of two. Um, and when you go by classes of stem, the blue here has some collared versions and some collarless second best, and then you get into the ones with no collared availability, the blades being in, uh, in red, uh, and then the fit and fill collarless ones being in orange. And you can see three to four time risk of uh, revision all cause at three years for these stems, so they work better. Um, so it's forgiving in most anatomy, the prep is, and seating is consistent. Um, I think something that you, we've always strived for is kind of a quiet stem, so one when you come back several years later, these are all older x-rays that have been in for a long time, they look exactly the same as the day they were put in. You don't see any diaphyseal uh, thickening, you don't see any stress shielding, uh, it's very quiet. Um, I think that a lot of companies, uh, there's some, uh, reticence to use the collar uh, for some surgeons, and so they're coming out with collarless versions, and I would say look out for what's gonna happen. I think you're gonna start seeing the revision rates of those stems going up in the collarless version compared to the collared. Um, and again, I think this comes back to what was, the, what was the driver in this kind of being successful, and I think it is the DA approach that it's, again, more, more susceptible to implant issues on the femur side, and so if you have a more forgiving implant that's gonna work for more people, I think that's why you're seeing it, it it do better, and then the optimist way would say maybe people are moving around earlier, so you need more early stability. Um, that collar is going to give you that. Um, and then again, don't forget on the cemented stems too that a collar may be helpful for that exact same reason. Um, and that's just the same study. So moving on to the next topic, which is cement. Um, you know, cement has been around forever. This is the OG. Uh, you know. Uh, JC Superstar over here um, was cementing back in the day, but Americans, for some reason, we hate it. Um, I think it's because we like to go fast. It takes longer. We're not trained in it very well. Um, everyone who you ever talk to that hates cementing or, or refuses to ever use it will bring up bone cement implantation syndrome, which is not uh, an imaginary thing. It's real, and we'll talk about it a little bit. And we also hope hate taking it out later. And all Americans think they're super active and super fit, and so we need that super good press fit bond, right? That's, that's what all the patients want. Um, but in poor bone population, cemented stems do better. And this is also borne out uh, consistently with every registry, uh, with every study that's done. Uh, cemented stems survive better in, in poor bone. And so this is AJRR again, looking at uh, female patients over 65. Uh, blue is cemented, uh, or sorry, blue is cementless. This is failure rates, uh, and red is cemented, outperforming at all time points. There's been some randomized controls looking at, looking at this, mostly in fracture patients, because that's kind of picking a, a poor bone quality host. Um, and so you can compare 100 of each, cemented stem outperforms uncemented, uh, and also time to death in this study was, was uh, better for the cemented group. 
a revision for a, uh, an elderly patient or a frail patient is obviously not a good, a good thing. These are meta-analysis of uh, cemented versus cementless for hemiarthroplasties and femoral neck fractures favoring uh, the cemented stem strongly. This is again looking at more AJRR data. Uh, the revision risk for periprosthetic fracture being one tenth that of, uh, of a cementless stem. And it does bring up this thing though of mortality. There is an increased risk of mortality maybe with these cemented stems. Um, but this is again non-randomized data. This is looking just at AJR. There's probably more sick patients getting cemented stems. But that, that bone cement implantation syndrome is potentially an early issue. Um, when I was a fellow, uh, we gave the teaching award to some of our surrounding surgeons because they taught me never to cement, never to not cement heavy hemis. I should say not cement hemis. Um, this is one week of call at Ortho Carolina where you would just see these press fit hemis blowing up constantly. Um, and I'm happy to see that cemented stems are kind of coming back in the uh, resurging a little bit for, this is femoral neck data. So this is age of patient by the percent cemented in the AJRR. You can see even above 90 years old, 50% of us are not cementing femoral neck fractures. That is crazy to me. Um, this is the, the same thing. Red is totals and uh, yellow is hemis for femoral neck fractures. When I was a fellow was, was right here. This is the kind of worst time if you're a cement uh, lover uh, and it's slowly coming back up. Um, I would also say that, you know, some of this again comes back to approach. There's a trend in kind of this middle range that people were doing more and more DA and there was this thing of, oh, I can't cement from the front. It's way more complicated. Um, I think as we're getting more comfortable again, it's hopefully coming back up. This is for uh, primary total hips, uh, the percent, you do, this is elective total hips. We're also seeing this kind of drifting up again in the overall usage around 5% now. Um, if you don't know how to do it, there are way, there's courses everywhere on cementing now, especially from the front, uh, training programs, hopefully we're doing a better job of cementing intermittently, um, and there's tons of papers showing all this data. <clears throat> so my soapbox, I get, I get to talk about this for a second. Um, you know, it's, uh, we, we can show you tips and tricks. It should be every femoral neck fracture should be cemented. The data on that is incredibly strong. It's proven poor bone. Uh, women over 70 or 75, you should probably have a reason not to. And, and so I asked for it on backup on those cases. And if you can just push the second brooch in by hand, it's probably time to switch to cement. Uh, if it's door C, you should decide ahead of time and open the implants, open the stuff so you can't change your mind in the middle. Like we all think we're really good and like, ah, I can press fit this, but just decide ahead of time and, and you'll be happier in the long run. And then use a cement design with a good track record, either one of these collared I-beams or a smooth taper. I started off using kind of an Exeter style stem, um, but uh, with trainees, as kind of Derek alluded to earlier, this was just a <laughs> mess. They, they can't hold it still or it subsides deeper. And so using an implant with a collar has been much more reproducible for me. And the, the fracture stuff coming out now. In the acetabulum, we use it too, cementing in these, I love these uh, monoblock dual mobility liners for big big disasters or for these triflanges, I almost never use constrained liners because you can get such a big head put in the right spot. And the last thing I want to talk about was locking screws. So, you know, this has been around for decades in trauma and we've all seen the AO courses with this is a non-locking plate with non-locking screws. Each screw is independent and kind of toggle and so you get these kind of pull out failures uh, that don't look great. And if you put in a locking screw, uh, why is this? See, we'll skip forward a little bit. Put in locking screw constructs, same number of screws, um, and the failure mechanism is always, obviously going to be much, much different. <clears throat> this is obviously a, a less ripe apple as well. <laughs> um, so if, if we think about locking screw indications as poor bone, short segment, crumbly, comminuted bone, that's an arthroplasty patient, right? These are, these are patients that locking screws are gonna work well in. So in the femur, you saw Dr. Kandemir can kind of put anything together with locking screws and some plates and duct tape. Um, they all have nice periprosthetic options now with locking, with locking screws on the femur. Um, this is a case that I just thought was interesting because um, this, this is a, a DA hemi that was done um, with a troke fracture. This is the, actually the second attempted uh, 
trope fixation construct uh, then came to me, and I don't usually fix fix stuff like this, but I, I did an attempt at it, and you can see I got a clamp, I got a clamp on there and everything. Look at this AO <laughs> technique there, and we put in this kind of locking plate uh, that captured that that troke fragment. And this is a year and a half out, still not, still hasn't disappeared on me. It's still still sitting where it's supposed to be. Um, in the acetabulum, I think you're going to start seeing a lot of data coming out on locking screw technology in the acetabulum for big revisions. I, I love this. You know, it's not just the every screw has great bite joke, but it's it's literally I think helps with stability early on in some big holes, reduces maybe the need for as many augments, um, and you know, in cup cage constructs, you make these kind of Sputnik looking things that that don't come out. Um, you can do some big, big, crazy stuff. So in conclusion, old idea doesn't mean bad. 1962 was a great year for the, uh, this is the Ferrari 250, and then the same year that the Charlie came out, two of the sexiest things ever. And then data supports collars and cemented and selective cementing. And our lives can get easier with automation, custom implants, and, and some locking screw stuff. So thank you. <laughs> All right, we have five minutes before we have to go to the breakout session, so uh, if people have questions, we can uh, start on that. But in the meantime, I'll start off. Uh, Keith, so you talk about efficiency. Um, Ortho Carolina has a lot of uh, teaching responsibilities. How do you balance efficiency with, with fellow teaching? Sure, I mean, I think it depends on what your commitment is. I mean, we're committed to teaching the fellows, and so you can only be efficient to a point when you're training. Um, you're not gonna be like the guy that's in private practice not teaching. I think the the uh, ceiling is much higher for them as far as efficiency. Um, but we do balance it. I mean, I think when you're running two rooms with fellows and trainees, uh, there are ways to be efficient um, and still do that in a teaching institution. I think it's important to teach them how to be efficient in the operating room because they're going to need that when they go uh, into uh, practice. I mean, I think that's one thing I'm always kind of looking at. You know, most of our fellows are very good and very well trained before they even come to us and just trying to tweak little things, little moves that they make and say, well, you know, this could be a little more efficient if you do this rather than those three steps you just did. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'll go down the line. Al, so um, clearly you're not a fan of robotics. But is there, uh, there's been a lot of data presented on, on other technologies in the OR. Can you think of other data that's presented or other uh, technologies that you think are going to make a meaningful impact in hip replacement surgery? So I, would, I wouldn't say that I'm not a fan of robotics. I would say that we don't have data long term to justify it yet. But I, but I would like to see, just like Stefano mentioned, that robotics allows us to do things that we cannot do manually, whether that's putting something in, uh, in a patient with a stiff spine, whether it's doing surgeries that we haven't yet imagined. I think the possibilities are there. I don't know that robotics will let us do things that we do very well manually better. So in terms of technology that I would see, uh, this isn't related to, I, I guess, two things. So number one, uh, as Dr. Hansen mentioned, actually using our data that we have stored for robotics to make meaningful changes in what we do. And number two, uh, implant materials that resist or are antimicrobial. Great. Christine? Hi, Christine Pui from Minneapolis. Um, Dr. Heldelston, can you talk about abductor tendon tears? Um, do they affect stability? If you see them, do you repair them? And then anterior guys, um, are you able to repair abductor tendon tears if you see them intraoperatively? Yeah, hi, Christine. That's a great question. So. Um, you know, I don't think all abductor tendon tears are the same. Um, we wrote a paper based on Dennis Burke's experience at Mass General using an Achilles tendon allograft with a calcaneal bone block to repair these. And uh, the initial results were very um, uh, good uh, in terms of reducing pain. They weren't terribly great at reducing uh, or increasing somebody's strength. So the pain relief was excellent, but uh, the strength grade usually only went up uh, by one. So that was a little disappointing. But 
What we found is in some of these that uh, the trochanter actually sort of melted away from pressure on the allograft, um, and that uh, isn't something that we wanted to see. So I have much less enthusiasm for that technique. So it is an option. Um, what we see more commonly, and I think probably a couple times a year, we'll see sort of the rotator cuff tear equivalent of the hip, uh, and it's usually elderly females. And, and if you look back at the x-rays, you can see some sort of early heterotopic ossification around the trochanter that suggests they have sort of a chronic inflammatory process there. So in those patients, um, I will uh, basically roughen up uh, the tip of the trochanter and I'll do just a tension band with an ethabon suture. Um, and uh, not through bone, but through the vastus lateralis, uh, tendon on the adductor tubercle there. So, uh, and then I protect their weight bearing. Um, can I say that that works? I, I can't tell you for sure. But uh, I've actually been surprised by uh, the patients who uh, don't really seem to have a big limp or any limp at all by doing that. So I do think it helps, but I, I can't tell you that I can prove that. Um, and another thing that you should realize is that if somebody comes in with hip arthritis that they've had for a long time and they have a huge amount of pain sort of suddenly, uh, I would suspect that they have an adductor, te abductor tendon tear, uh, and that's contributing to their pain and their limp. So when I look back on the patients who we see the sort of unexpected part partially bald trochanter during the approach. Uh, a lot of them had this sort of acute exacerbation of pain, which should tip you off. And if you can pick that up, then you can counsel them appropriately that, look, this may be a little bit more complicated. Um, so uh, the other thing I'll tell you is that I would definitely document in your operative report uh, that they have this. Um, and uh, one of the other things we see is some sort of fatty infiltration of the abductor musculature in this point, and that I have a patient who dislocated with that. Um, unfortunately, the fellow dislocated the patient uh, patient's hip in the operating room at six weeks post-op. Uh, she ended up having to be revised, but um, uh, she, uh, in the note, I, I dictated very clearly that she had uh, fatty infiltration of her abductor musculature, and I think that probably saved me from getting sued. So um, we do see it, and uh, I just I think it's hard. If you ever tried to be uh, toe-touch weight-bearing, it's, it's very, very hard to do. And so I tend to be a little bit more conservative and, and, and tell people to be toe-touch because you know they're not going to be, but I just think it's a hard area to protect and regardless of what type of repair you do, I, I'm not sure how well it works. You know, there are good data from white sides doing uh, advancements of the gluteus maximus tendon and things like that, and I think that works as well, but nothing's perfect. How about for the anterior guys? Do you see the tears? Do you treat the tears? What are your uh, experiences? Um, so I, I try to find them ahead of time, right? I, I think there's some papers that have come out that are quoting like uh, they're seeing like 10 to 15 percent of people with tears. Like I, I don't know that it's that high. Like this is a surgery that works really, really well, right? And from the DA, you cannot really see or repair it that well. Um, so you got to pick it up ahead of time. Like I do minimal to no physical exam, but one of the things I check is their abductor, right? So um, if you know ahead of time, you might do a different approach to try and repair it. And just to push for for later in the program. Dr. Beanie is going to kind of show what his experience has been with this and kind of how he's been fixing them. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with Jeff. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to really identify these or repair them uh, through the anterior approach at the time of surgery. I think you've got to find them uh, before surgery. But even then, it's a very rare instance. Okay, I'll ask a couple more questions. Um, Hutch, what's your typical workup for patients that are coming in with uh, an already unstable total hip replacement now? Yeah, so I, you know, you, you want to figure out what's causing it, obviously. So, um, first thing I'll do is look at the X-rays and uh, see if there's sort of suboptimal positioning. Um, Today, I, I think that uh, that's much less common than it was when I started practice 20 years ago. Uh, and then you want to assess sort of the patient factors. So if the patient's an alcoholic, you can probably pick that up. If they have a neurodegenerative disease, you can pick that up. Uh, and then all of these patients will get a uh, uh, some degree of hip spine analysis. So I'll usually just do the two lateral x-rays if they haven't had them. Um, if uh, those don't help me a whole lot, I will add the CT scan, which allows us to do some plan more advanced planning, which can give you a specific target zone if you think you're going to have to um, revise the patient. So, But, but honestly, I, I think just getting the la two lateral x-rays standing and flex seated gives you enough information, and you can decide what you need to do based on that. Great. Um, and then, Jeff, we talked a little bit about uh, the bone cement uh, implantation syndrome. What are you doing to sort of minimize that, or how do you manage the patient intraoperatively that you're cementing? 
Yeah, I, I think the one the one thing that I that I try to do consistently is, is the beginning of the case when we're doing a timeout, I will tell anesthesia like, hey, we may be cementing this one, and I'll try to give you a heads up before we do. Um, they definitely need to be aware that you're going to cement, and if they don't know what they're supposed to be aware of, you need to tell them, which is like they need to have the oxygen turn all the way up before you cement, so that if, when you do send the emboli, that if they're kind of borderline, they're they're kind of prepped already full of oxygen. Um, I, I try to, I do a fourth generation cement technique, which, which does pressurize a lot. Um, if there's a really frail patient, like an older uh, person with a lot of pulmonary hypertension or issues like that, I'm definitely not going to pressurize the cement as much. So there are times when I'm not fully pressurizing as much or don't do the final like push your thumb down kind of thing with the cement so that I'm maybe sending a little bit less. Um, but those are the two big things. Hydration is also the key there. So the classic example, this is the hip fracture patient who's been lying around for three days who needed to get an echo that they didn't really need to get, and they're very dehydrated by the time they get uh, to the operating room and don't rely on the anesthesiologist to be able to pick that up. Yeah, so I think those are very important points. I mean, this is, if you're going to have an intraoperative death, that's most likely going to be the case. Uh, I mean, the pathophysiology of this is it's that you're going to have uh, a right heart failure with this. So you're going to have veno dilation, so that empties the right heart. Um, if you have pulmonary hypertension, that's going to exacerbate it. And once your heart is empty, that sort of uh, leads down to a, a precarious position. So um, large bore IVs, absolutely, they'll get a, a massive hydration going on. And then um, that is much more of a priority than a, a presser. So I think all those are very important things for the anesthesiologist to be aware of. And uh, unfortunately, and this, you know, in teach institute it may be a little bit better, but uh, this is a lost art for the anesthesiologist that they're, because we're not doing enough of these, that you have to be the one that's responsible for telling him what to do. So uh, perfect. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I think we're going to go to the breakout sessions now.